Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone here. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open those up. We're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 5. I just want to introduce myself to you. Uh, my name is Pastor Bill, Bill Penna. I am from uh, Calvary Chapel Grace Fellowship in New York. How many of you guys ever heard of New York? New York City, anybody? Yes. Praise the Lord. I, I ask you to pray for us. Uh, you know, there are many people in New York that need to, that need to know what you know about Jesus. Uh, I'm married to my wife. Her name is Rachel. We've been married for 21 years. That woman has put up with me for 21 years. You must pray for her. She needs much prayer. But uh, I have five children, five children, no money. Five children, no money. They take all of it. My oldest child, her, her name is Bethany. She is 18. Uh, my son, Luke, he is 16. He is, uh, I had to start working out again because he's getting so strong, I'm not going to allow him to beat me up, you know. He is 16. My son, uh, my, my third child, her name is Sayla. She is seven. She's beautiful, special. And then our fourth child, his name is Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is a lion. He, uh, he's just like me. He is, uh, he is not very obedient to his mother. But... Uh, and then our last child, our number five, and pray for me, hopefully it is our very last. I told the Lord, no more, please, no more. Our last child, his name is Christian, Christian. And my wife, Rachel, and I named him Christian because we believe the only thing necessary for God to do what he wants to do in our world is for you and I just to be real Christians, right, amen? So it's exciting. I'm, I'm so glad to be with you. Uh, Kenya is a beautiful place. Uh, the food is too good. It is too good. As you can tell, I have put on some weight since being here, so please, no more food. No more food. But uh, just so happy to be here to see what Jesus is doing in and through you, especially here at Calvary Chapel, Eldoret. This is a very, very powerful church. I hope you know that. God is doing amazing things. So, that is it in the way of introductions. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Um, I want to, uh, we're going to look there. And then if you'd also like to put a place in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Today we're going to look at a message that I've entitled, Restoring the Presence of God Back to God's People. Restoring the Presence of God Back to the People of God. And a simpler title would simply be revival. Revival. What is revival? It's when the presence of God is working through the word of God, by the spirit of God, in the people of God, through the church of God. And guess what happens? It fills up the church. And you know what happens? It spills out into the world around us. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. If you would, uh, we're going to pray and then uh, we will dive into God's word. Would you pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, we stop today. And though we come to your house, we come to the, the house of the Lord, as we are the church, we are the ecclesia, we are the called out ones. You have called each one of us by name. As your word says, my sheep hear my voice and they listen to me. And Lord, we have been called out of this world, called into the body of Christ, into the church. And this morning as the church, just as the first church did, Lord, we are giving ourselves to the apostles' doctrine. Lord, the breaking of bread, we are looking and remembering the cross. Lord, to fellowship. And Lord, we are praying. We are here with prayerful hearts. So Lord, I pray this morning for each and every individual here that you would speak, Lord, as we are your sons, we are your daughters, and we pray, Lord, as, as Samuel prayed, we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. And we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. My son, Luke, he's 16 years old, and when he was a little boy, he was about five years old, I told my wife, I says, I'm bringing Luke on a, a, a hike with me. You see, in New York, we have big mountains. We have big mountains. And a group of my friends and I were going on a hike up to a mountain, and we were going to hike to a waterfall, a waterfall. Now, my wife, she knows me better than you know me. 
So when I said, I'm bringing Luke on a hike with me to a waterfall, she looked at me very seriously. And she says, please, please, do not do anything to Luke that will hurt him. Keep him safe. And I said, honey, you've got nothing to worry about. So I took Luke, we got in the car, we got to the mountain, we all began to hike. And as we were hiking through the woods, through the mountain, we got to the waterfall, and my son Luke, at five years old, already knew me so well. He saw the waterfall, and he saw me. He saw the waterfall, and he saw me. And he looked at me, and he says, Daddy. And I said, yes, son. He says, please, don't make me jump off the waterfall. I says, don't worry, son. You're with Dad. Everything's going to be fine. He said, no, Daddy. I said, yes, son. And we came to the base of the waterfall. In order to climb up to the top, there was a very steep rock face. So I said, Luke, I'm going to pick you up and put you on my back. And he says, no, daddy. I said, yes, son. And I put him on my back, and I began to climb up the side of this rock face. And we climbed, and I could hear him <laughs> crying. But I'm his daddy, so I don't care if he cries, you know. So we kept climbing. When we got to the top... I was standing on the edge of the, the rock face, getting ready to jump off the waterfall, but first I picked him up and I brought him to my front. And tears were streaming down his little face. And he said, Daddy, and I said, yes, son. He says, Daddy, did you ask Mommy? I said, son, Mommy is not here right now. I am your daddy. And on the count of three, we are going to jump. He said, no, daddy. I said, yes, one. <laughs> he cried, no, daddy. I said, yes, two. And I said, he said, daddy, please, I'm going to tell mommy on you, he said. And I said, your mommy is not here. I am your daddy. Three, and we jumped. Somebody who was there actually got a picture of this. It's on the wall in my office back at the church in New York. And we jumped off this waterfall. I was holding on to him. He was holding me so tight, I could not breathe. <gasps> you know, he's so tight. And I jumped and we hit the water. <laughs> we went way under the water. And I was holding him really tight. And he was crying the whole way down. <laughs> we hit the water. And when we came up out of the water, all of his tears were gone. He was no longer crying. When we burst through the water, now there was a giant smile on his face and he looked at me and he said, daddy, and I said, yes. He says, can we do it again? <laughs> we did it again and again and again until daddy was so tired. I said, please, no more son, no more. <laughs> Listen, today we are going to talk about restoring the presence of God back to God's people. We are going to talk about jumping into the river of God's spirit, of the presence of God, jumping into the truth and the knowledge of God, jumping into the word of God. We're gonna talk about uh, how, how to get rid of sin in our lives. How do we get free from all the idols? The idols. We have idols in New York. We have false gods that are worshiped. Here in Kenya, Though you love Jesus, there are false gods around us. And we're going to talk and see from God's word how God topples these false gods. How you and I can jump in to the power and the presence of God. You see, here in this text, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 5. At this time in Israel's history, Israel in the previous chapter had just been defeated by the Philistine army. Do you know that it is God's desire to give you and I victory in our walks with the Lord? It is God's desire for you and I as God's people to walk in the word of God, in the power of the spirit of God, with the people of God, in the church of God, and to be able to go into this world with victory. But the children of Israel had begun to move away from the God of the Bible. And at this time in Israel's history, there was a man on the scene, a judge of Israel, his name was Samson. Samson, you know Samson, he was powerful, he was strong, he was, but, but he was not very obedient to the Lord. At this point, Samson uh, just had previously killed 
30 Philistines. Why did he kill him? Well, Samson was about to get married and he had no proper outfits for his groomsmen. So Samson said, I know what to do. I'll go kill 30 Philistines, take their clothes off of them and say, here you go, boys. You can wear this in the wedding. Talk about a wedding party, right? 30, Samson. Scholars tell us chronologically that Samson had already tied those torches to the flames, to the tails of those foxes. Remember this in Judges? And he set them loose on the Philistines' farmland. And they had burned the farmland to the ground. Israel had moved away from God, from the presence of God, from the reality of God. You know, there's a difference from having God in our minds and God ruling and reigning on the throne of our hearts, isn't there? And in chapter four, Israel had made an error, a serious mistake that many of God's people make. And I want you to see this, and then we're gonna dive into the text. It's 1 Samuel chapter four. Uh, there, we're gonna pick it up in verse three, just so you understand why they lost the battle. 1 Samuel chapter four, verse three, it says, and when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? They had just lost the battle to the Philistines. And you're about to see why they lost. They says, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Then he says, let us bring, note this, the Ark of the Covenant. You know, the Ark of the Covenant. That was where the mercy seat stood, where the presence of God was in the center of Israel's camp. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. And I want you to see this. And if you have your pen, circle this. It says, when it, can you guys say it? It. Circle that in your Bible. When it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. You see, Israel forgot that it, the Ark of the Covenant, was not where the power was. But the power was in the God of the covenant. And they're gonna learn this. God is going to teach them this, and that's what we're gonna to see today. First Samuel chapter five, we begin verse one, watch this. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it. So just as Israel had forgot who God was, the, the enemies of God, the Philistines, also did not know who God was. They thought he was an it, but God is a who. <laughs> We walk with him. There's an old hymn, I'm sure you've heard of it. It says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there is like no one, do you know that, has ever known. The Philistines did not know who God was, but the people of God had also forgot who God was. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Listen, the Philistines are about to discover who the God of the Bible is. Verse two, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon. Now listen, for your note takers, you can circle that name Dagon. This was the God that the Philistines worship. He was a fish God. Now, how many people here like to eat fish? Anybody? I know there's some fish. I had a beautiful fish meal here in, in, in uh, Kenya. I've eaten too much food here in Kenya. But if, if you invited me to your house this afternoon and you put fish on the table, but before we ate, we didn't pray to the God of the Bible, we knelt down and says, oh, fish, we praise you. I would say, I am not eating here. I'm sorry. Let us go to KFC or something like this. You see, they worshiped a fish God. He was like Poseidon. He was, had the body of a man, the upper body, and the torso and legs of a fish. And this is who they worshiped. They worshiped a foolish God, a God that doesn't exist, a God that was fashioned with their own hands. The idol that they worshiped, they built themselves. You know, as I've driven around Kenya, Pastor Peter has showed me all around Kenya, uh, around uh, your, your, your area here in Eldoret. One thing I've seen is there are so many Hindu temples. It's kind of shocking. And it's interesting because the Hindus, they believe, their scriptures tell them, that the whole entire earth, right, the earth that we are on right now, that it actually sits on the back of a giant elephant. Did you know this? And that each one of the elephant's feet rest on the back of four giant turtles. Now people say, well, you know, don't be so judgmental. 
all roads lead to heaven. All religions are true. Well, let's take just the Hindu God or the Hindu scriptures. You know, I, we know this now. We have gotten on spaceships and we have left the, the atmosphere of the earth. And guess what? When the astronauts got into outer space and they looked back on the earth, did they see a giant elephant? Did they see four giant turtles and the elephant balancing on the turtles? I mean, at this point, the elephant would be a bit tired, don't you think? What did they see? Well, they saw what the Bible said, that the earth, guess what? It hangs on nothing. See, God's got the whole world in his hands, doesn't he? And the, 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 the Philistines who worship Dagon, they take the ark of God and now they bring it into the temple of Dagon. Imagine it with me. It's as if the altar of Dagon is here and they put the, the ark of the covenant to, to, in a position of submission to their God. You see, the Philistines got confused. The world is confused right now. Because many of God's people, we are not, and I pray the, the Holy Spirit is beginning to move. I know in New York he is, and it's clear he's doing it here. He's beginning to move, and the people of God are, are getting in line with Jesus more clearly, and their power is returning. But the Philistines didn't understand something. They thought they had defeated the God of Israel. They did not. The Philistines defeated the people of Israel. But the God of Israel was about to show them you have not even begun to defeat me. And that's what happens here. They bring the Ark of the Covenant into the house of Dagon, watch this, and they set it by Dagon. So they put the Ark of the Covenant, big mistake, big mistake. Verse three, and when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, so the next morning they walk into the temple, what do they find? In the morning, there was Dagon falling on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. What did happen? They walk into the temple of Dagon and what happens? They, they look at it, shh, 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 there's a worship service going on, shh. Dagon is worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what do they do? Well, look what they do. Watch this. So they took Dagon and they set it in its place again. <laughs> they picked up their God and they set him up again. Listen, if you're taking note this morning, number one, first thing I want to mark out to you here, as we talk about restoring the presence of God back to God's people, number one, is only worship Jesus. My friends, only Jesus is worthy of worship. There are so many idols in this world. In the United States of America, there are so many idols. Right? We have the idol called mammon. Do you guys know what mammon is? Money where people will bow down, they will worship mammon. We have the God of Aphrodite, it's sex, it's lust. And people will give their lives to these things, hoping that by worshiping sex and lust, that their lives will be satisfied. There's the God of Baal, of power, conquest. And people will lay their lives down, they will surrender it. But listen, here in the text we see the God Dagon and we see that God's presence causes Dagon to fall. You know, brothers and sisters, we are only to worship Jesus. Only Jesus. You know, in the book of Acts, and the book of Acts was written 2,000 years ago, we see a book that was written to a culture more similar to yours than to mine. More similar. You know, where I live in New York, it's a concrete jungle, we call it. <laughs> Building so high. But as Paul the Apostle and Barnabas uh, went into the city of Lystra and, the, and God used them to heal a man, the people of Lystra came out with cows and animals. They brought them to, get, to, to sacrifice, to worship Paul and Barnabas. And what did Paul and Barnabas do? They rent their garments. This was 2,000 years ago. They rent their garments. They says, no, we are men just like you. You know, I want to tell you here, you know, I'm from New York. I'm a pastor of a church. Brothers, sisters, I am a man just like you. You don't believe me? I'll bring my wife next time. She will tell you. She will say, don't be too impressed. Don't be too impressed. He's a man just like you. Actually, you might be a little better. <laughs> it's the truth. Remember Peter? Peter goes to Cornelius' house. 
Cornelius of the Italian regiment. Now I'm Italian. What does that mean? Peter had never smelled smells like this before. He smelled, is that spaghetti and meatballs? You know, oh, lasagna? I'm telling you, do yourself a favor. Have some Italian food. It's good. And he gets there, and Cornelius is so happy to see him. Cornelius bows down to Peter 2,000 years ago. The apostle Peter. What did Peter do? Peter said, and Peter was a big dude, so he boom, lifted Cornelius. Goodness, whoo, lifted him up, put him on his feet. And Peter looked at Cornelius and says, do not do that. Don't do that. I'm a man just like you. Brothers, sisters, only worship Jesus. No one else, nothing else. No one else is deserving of our praise, right? Amen? Only Jesus. And watch what happens. Verse three. So Dagon has fallen. The Philistines pick him up because that's their little idol that they worship. So God says, I don't think they're getting the point. I'm going to help them a little. Watch this. Verse three, and when the people of Ashdod, uh, excuse me, arose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on his face to the earth, the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Verse four, and when they arose the next morning, so they didn't get it on the first morning, so God is going to help them. There was Dagon again. But this time, Dagon was fallen, watch this, Dagon was fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, but this time, the head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God dropped Dagon all by himself. And this is a powerful thing. Look at this. Fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon, both his palms were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. The only thing left of Dagon was the fish part. It was gone. God had broken him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor anyone who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this place. The Philistines clearly still did not get it. Listen, if you're taking note, it's number two this morning. Number two, restoring the presence of God back to God's people. Number one was only worship Jesus. Number two is Jesus never loses. Brothers, sisters, there's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It's found in Paul's letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, you're a pastor, and I'm proud of you, and I'm encouraging you. But God says to Timothy, Timothy, when you are faithless, God remains faithful. Do you understand that? When you and I are faithless, God still doesn't lose. You know, I have five children, and in America there is much traffic, You think you have a lot of traffic. One day you will visit New York and you will say, oh, I like Eldoret so much. There's so much traffic. And when I take my younger children to the store and we walk through the parking lot, my son Judah, remember I told you he's just like me. So every time we walk and I hold his hand, the whole time he's trying to get his fingers out of my hand. But I can't let him go because there's all these cars. But a few years ago, I got tired of him wiggling his hand. So I pushed him out into the traffic. No, I did not. I didn't do that. You go, these New Yorkers are crazy. It's true, it's true. I did not. You know what happened? As he was in my hand and he was shaking his little boy hand, you know, I held him tighter. I gripped him harder. He says, daddy, that hurts. And I said, it'll hurt a lot more if you get run over by a car, son. And he kept shaking, kept shaking. So you know what I did? I bent down and I picked him up. Listen, brothers and sisters, Jesus never loses. If you are here today and you are a child of God, I'm going to see you in heaven. I think a few of those songs we sang today, we're going to sing there. I'm going to put a request in with God. I want to sing that one. But we're going to make it. God is for us. He's with us. But we've got these challenges this side of heaven, don't we? These idols in our lives, these challenges, right? Maybe you're here today and, and you go, it's, it's easy for you to say, don't worship mammon. You've got mammon. You've got money. But I don't have much money. Okay. You say, oh, it's easy for you to say, don't worship Aphrodite. You're married. 
It's easy to say, okay, it's easy for you to say, don't worship Baal or power. You're a pastor. But listen, this is a question. How does a Christian get free from the bondage of these false idols? How do we do it? Do we focus on mammon? Do we focus on not sinning with Aphrodite? Do we focus on Baal? No, we see in our text how you get free. The way you get free from the idols in your life, the way that a nation gets free from the idols that they serve, is you bring in the presence of Almighty God. That's it. You put God back in the place that he deserves. And it's not about religion. The word religion comes from the Latin word relingero, which means to relink. Religion is man's attempt to relink with God. It never will work. Religion is all about an it. It, the Ark of the Covenant. It, the, 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 the idol of Dagon. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not a hit. He is a who. He's also not a how, he's a who. You wanna reach your neighbor for Christ? You wanna reach your coworker for Christ? Don't tell them about the it's. Tell them about the who. Tell them about Jesus. Give them Jesus, and that's what happens. The, the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the altar of Dagon. Dagon falls prostrate. His head and his hands are gone, and he was, I want you to understand this. God was proving, God was showing you and me that he loves the Philistines. This was grace to the Philistines. He broke their idol to a place that it was irreparable. You could almost see some of the priests scurrying off, getting the glue, trying to put Dagon's head back on him. And they put the glue and they say, okay, good. And then a, a wind blew, boop, Dagon's head fell. <laughs> okay. Oh, got to put his head back on. These idols, these false gods, God, God won the battle all by himself. The armies of Israel lost, but God won by himself. Brothers and sisters, God is going to win. He is winning. He is. Watch what happens next. Verse six. I love this. This is my favorite part. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod. These were the Philistines. And he ravaged them and he struck them with tumors. Now listen, it's not tumors. In the original language, the Old Testament, which is Hebrew, it is the Hebrew word hemorrhoids, hemorrhoids. And I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands who knows what the word hemorrhoids means because it will probably tell us something. But he struck them with hemorrhoids. Both Ashdod and its territory. <laughs> Verse seven, you gotta love God. You know, people think God does not, if you think God is in heaven going, he is just stoic. I don't think so. I could almost see Michael and Gabriel, the archangels, looking at God going, how are we gonna get the Philistines' attention? God says, I think I have an idea. It's interesting. But Ashdod and its territory, watch this, verse seven, and when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, when they saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us. Guys, listen, understand this, the Philistines, Miss the point. Rather than realizing, okay, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true and living God is here, and he's bringing discipline to us because he wants us to see the truth. Rather than embracing the presence of God, rather than embracing the word of God, the truth of God, what they did was they sent it away from them. They, they thought the answer to being free from the discipline of God is getting God away from us. Does anyone know where you can flee to get away from God? Anybody know? There's nowhere. Remember King David in the Psalms? He says, Lord, where can I go from your presence? You know, after David fell with Bathsheba, he wanted to run from the presence of God. And he wrote there and he says, if I make my bed in the depths of hell, the Lord looks and goes, what are we doing here? Why are we here, son? Why are we here, daughter? I have a seat at my table, you're my child. The Philistines missed the point and they says, we need to get the presence of God away from us. What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? Verse eight, therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines 
What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, let the ark of the God of Israel, what, look at this, these are great friends to have. Some of you need to change your friends. Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. These are their fellow countrymen. They says, oh, it's been so good to us. The God of Israel has disciplined us with hemorrhoids. Let's bless our neighbor. Let's bless our neighbor. Be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of the God of Israel away. So it was after they had carried away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and hemorrhoids, tumors, broke out on them. Does anybody remember a man who came from Gath? He was not small, he was great. Anybody remember? How about Goliath? Goliath had brothers. You see, God was being gracious to Goliath here. Before David will kill him with a sling and a stone in a few chapters as Goliath is blaspheming God, God will humble Goliath. God will humble him. Goliath here, as the ark of God comes into his city, will bend his knee. <laughs> well, at least he'll fall to his knees. <laughs> God has a way of doing this. Listen, if you're taking notice, number three, restoring the presence of God back to God's people. Number three is he, God, will deal with it if you don't. Brothers and sisters, in our lives, God will deal with our idols if we choose not to. You know, one thing I tell my children at home is I say, children, there's an easy way to do things and there is a hard way. I encourage you to do it the easy way. But I tell my kids, no matter which way you choose, it will be done. Uh, my oldest child, her name is Bethany. She's 18. And when she was little, um, you know, in our home, we do what the Bible says, so we give them spankings. Any parents here? Any parents? Yes? You know what I'm talking of. And in our home, we have a little wooden spoon. We call it the rod of correction. If, if you had it, you would think we were using it to make soup. If my children saw the rod of correction, they go like this. They know what it means. And when Bethany was very little, she was just like her father. I've got two kids just like me. The other three are perfect like their mother. But when she was little, she always would get into mischief. And I'd get home from work and my wife would say, listen, when you get home today, Bethany needs, she needs a little help from you. Okay, yes, ma'am. So I would come home and one, about two weeks earlier than this, than the, this certain occasion, uh, she was getting ready, you know, I got home and she knew she was in trouble, she was crying and I'd bring her into the room and we'd talk about what she did. But rather than disciplining her, rather than giving her a spanking, the hand of the Lord being heavy upon her, rather than doing that, I actually says, today I'm gonna teach you something new. She said, what is it, daddy? She said, I'm gonna teach you about grace. And I said, today, rather than you getting what you deserve, you're gonna get what you don't deserve. And out of my back pocket, I pulled a piece of candy. She was like, I love grace, you know? Oh, she received it. So now it's two weeks later, and she had done something that her mother think, thought she should get a spanking for. So I got home, and she was crying, but when we got in the room, I could see her little young mind working. She was trying to think, what was that word? I want more of that word. Maybe daddy has candy in his pocket. But rather than saying grace, she says, daddy, daddy, can you give me, can you give me? And she says, daddy, can you give me peace? And I said, honey, I'm about to give you peace right now. You know? <laughs> I gave her a little, little help. Listen, God is doing that for the Philistines. He is disciplining them. All the idols of the world must fall. Brothers and sisters, if you've read the book of Revelation, you know all the idols of the world will fall. And it'll be Jesus. But for you and I as his kids, all these idols must fall. God is at work. This is where revival comes from. It's when we, it's when we begin to remove the blockades of God's spirit in our lives. I want you to see this, Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two, verse nine through 11. I'll read it to you. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Paul the apostle here says, therefore God also has highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name. 
Do you know there's no other name above the name of Jesus? Do you know that, that there's no president, there's no world ruler? There's no name above the name of Jesus, verse 10, that listen, at the name of Jesus, listen to this, every knee should bow of those that are already in heaven, of those on the earth, and listen to this, and of those under the earth. Folks, just so you know, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, has already died. Muhammad will bow to Jesus Christ. All of the false prophets of the Hindus will bow to Jesus. Do you know, listen, that Satan himself, Lucifer himself, will be bowing at the feet of Jesus Christ? And he hates it when we, when we understand that. There, Jesus is in charge. All idols will fall. You see, at the beginning, we talked about this river of God, the river that's moving, the waterfall that I jumped off with my son. And listen, listen, the, the, the river of God's blessing, the river of God's spirit, and we see it in the book of Ezekiel. If you've ever read that chapter, wherever the river flowed, it brought life to dead places. In Israel right now, the Bible tells us that under the, the Mount of Olives, that when Jesus returns, his feet will land the, the Mount of Olives will break in two and water will flow. And if you've ever been to Israel, there's something in Israel called the Dead Sea. Anybody ever heard of the Dead Sea? And this is what Ezekiel's physically talking about. The water will flow in that Dead Sea. The water from under the throne of God will flow to it physically and the Dead Sea will become alive. Spiritually, that is exactly what God is doing today. Is the water is flowing the water is flowing and many, many Christians are on the banks of the river coming up with its and with hows rather than jumping into the river of who? Jesus Christ, who's flowing. And once the river's flowing, man, when you get in this river, things start moving. <laughs> you start getting cleaned up. If you jump in that river like my son Luke, you will say, I wanna do it again and again. But some things can block up, they can dam up the river of God. Do you know that? Idolatry, if you and I are worshiping at the feet of Baal, of Aphrodite, of Mammon, of man, it can dam up the river. We can put boulders into the riverbed and though the river is flowing from the cross, it stops the river from flowing through our lives in the way God intends. And you go, well, how do I get the boulders out? It's called repentance. <laughs> You remove the boulders. You say, Lord, forgive me. You confess your sins. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, can cleanse a man, can cleanse a woman of all sin. You confess your sin and he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is how God does it. And there in Philistia, God was looking to bring, to bring revival, to bring salvation. To the people of God today, he's looking to do that. Watch what happens. We're going to wrap this text up. Verse 10, watch this. Verse 10. Therefore, these are the Philistines, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So they sent the presence of God away to their neighbors, <laughs> to their fellow countrymen. So it was as the ark of God came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. Verse 11, so they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and they said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. He was bringing discipline to the Philistine nation because they rejected him. Verse 12, and the men who did not die were stricken with the hemorrhoids. They probably wished they had died. And the cry of the city went up to heaven. All of a sudden, the people started breaking free and crying out to heaven, saying, would you help me? Listen, my friends, God has a way of freeing us. God is on the move. He wants to restore his presence in our lives. He wants you and me as we leave church today to walk with him, to talk with him. 
He wants to speak to us and say, remind us, you are mine. You are precious to me. You are valuable. I want each of you here to know that God knows you by name. He knows your name. He knows your English name. He knows your African name. He knows your parents. He knows where you're from. He has chosen you. He has a purpose for you. There are people that God is going to speak through you to that are going to be brought into the family of God. You and I are going to gather around the throne of heaven very soon, and we will worship Jesus. And I want to make sure you know this. There are no different levels. You know, I'm not going to be in one section of heaven and you're in another. No, we are, <laughs> we're one people. Do you, do you know that? You know, the Bible teaches that we all have the same daddy. Do you guys know that? You, you're looking at me going, I don't think we have the same daddy. You need to look in the mirror. We had the same daddy. It was a little while ago, but there was a man named Noah. You guys know who Noah was? And he had this big boat called the Ark. And off of that Ark, three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. If we were around back then on Christmas morning, we'd all be gathered together. We're brothers and sisters. And this is what God was doing there in Israel at this time. God was showing the enemies of God who he was. God was showing the people of Israel who he was. But for the enemies of God, rather than choosing to humble themselves and worship and serve God, they sent the presence of God away. Listen, if you're here today and you do not yet have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and listen, that is the only way to have a relationship with God. Do not push Jesus away. Don't push him away. Receive him. Receive him. Receive the gift of eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ, through the cross, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Just receive him. He wants to change you. Now, I wanna, we got to wrap this up. But at this point, God is dealing with the enemies of God, but the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, will not immediately go back into the center of Israel's worship, Jerusalem. It actually will be many, many chapters from now. You'll go from here in 2 Samuel 5, and it doesn't happen until all the way to the next book of the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 6, until the Ark of the Covenant comes back into the center of his people's lives. Why is that? Listen, brothers, sisters, this is very important. God loves us very much. He loves you. He loves me. But, but, and I say this at our church in New York all the time. People say, I want to know God. I, they, I say, you want to know God? They say, I want to know God. I say, you want to know God? They say, I want to know God. And I say, oh, good. He wrote a book. <laughs> Do you guys know that God wrote a book? You want to know God? It's right here. The reason why I know God is because of the word of God. It's because I began to read and learn of who he was. And from here in 1 Samuel chapter 5, many things will happen in the life of God's people to prepare them for the presence of God, for the revival power of God, for the word of God to be once again set, set right in the midst of them. There were things that had to change in their lives. You know, the Philistines will attempt to send the ark uh, back uh, to Israel. It'll only make it to a city called Kirjath Jerim. A prophet by the name of Samuel will be raised up in Israel who will speak things over them and will begin to point them towards the Lord. The, the children of Israel, between this defeat of, of, of Dagon until the ark is restored, the children of Israel will say, okay, we believe in God, but we don't want to be too close to him. So they will ask for a king. They'll say, we want a king to follow. You can almost see God the Father in heaven going, I'm your king. You, you, you have access to me. But they say, we want a king, so God gives them a king. His name was Saul. But he will not be a king after God's heart. And, and Saul will bring problems upon Israel. Saul will disregard the, the sacrificial system. He will not listen to Samuel. He won't listen to the word of God. And the children of Israel will suffer because of, because of it. But God was teaching them something. God will anoint a man, a young man named David, who will be a man after God's heart. David will uh, have one of Israel's greatest fighting armies ever, his 400 mighty men, that the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 22, verse two, it says, and everyone who is in distress, everyone who is in debt, 
and everyone who is discontented gathered to him, and David became captain over them. What, why was David the captain? Because he was pointing them to Jesus. David was a man that was running after God's heart. You know, we, we have that phrase, David, a man after God's heart. And we almost make that into an it. It's not an it. All that means is David, when he woke up in the morning, says, Lord, I'm not as smart as people think I am. Lord, today, what do you want to do? Lord, I want to know what's on your heart for today. And God, please help that to be central. I want you to be central in my life. Any believer can do this. And God is restoring the heart to the people of Israel as he's preparing to restore his presence back into the center of everything they do. And David will, will, will be anointed king over all of Israel. The Philistines will be defeated. And in Israel, the word of God will be restored back to the people of God. They will reinstate trespass offerings like the Bible said to. They will reinstate you know, peace offerings. They will begin to do the work of God the way that God says it's to be done. You know, one thing that blesses me here, and I'm gonna say this, I didn't say it at the first service, but in Africa, I have been to churches, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not the pastor here, so I don't wanna rub, you know, do anything wrong, but I've been to churches where the pastors are sitting on the stage. I've been to churches in Africa where somebody in the community who has a, a different outfit on, and he's like a, some title, gets treated, the, 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 home, the poor man they walk by and they don't see him and the other man, oh, oh, and they bring him and they sit him in the front. And I, you guys don't know me very well, but I'm, I'm somewhat direct. <laughs> and I said to the pastor, what are we doing here? They go, oh, it is cultural. That is not cultural. The Bible was written 2,000 years ago to a culture just like this and the Bible says, don't do that. The Bible says, don't put the rich man in a position of favor and the poor man in another position. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of our sins. The same blood that has washed me of my sins washed you of your sins. And to be honest with you, you are probably better than me <laughs> in almost every way. I'm telling you. But I'm, I'm glad that I get to be equal with you. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see us, he doesn't see us separately. When God looks at us, <clears throat> He says, that's my family. Those are my sons and my daughters. And you know why I know this? Do you know why I know this? Because that's what the word of God says. And the word of God has authority over everything else. If you learn this book, Jesus said this. He says, if you, you will know the truth and the truth will do what? It will set you free. If somebody is teaching you something that is religious and you are getting bound in it, do you know what it is not? It is not the truth. Jesus' disciples, he lifted them up. He says, I no longer call you servants. I call you what? Friends. You and I are friends of God. And the word of God was restored to the people of God. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we will end here, I promise, the, the Ark of the Covenant is brought into the house of God. And even on its way, we don't have time to read it today, but read verse 1 through 12 later on today, David will try to bring the presence of God back into the house of God a little bit better way. People will die because they don't follow the word of God. And David will repent. He will fear the Lord. He'll do it God's way. The Ark of the Covenant, watch this, verse 13, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13. And so it was... When those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, <laughs> that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. You know what that meant? As these men were carrying the ark of the Lord, see this with me, there was blood. The whole trail was blood. They were walking on the blood of slain sacrifices. There is no way for the word of God and the presence of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ to be advanced through anything but the blood of Jesus Christ. People in America, they'll say, Pastor, you know, you have to stop talking so much about the blood of Jesus. I said, I'm not talking about the blood of Jesus. The word of God is talking about the blood of Jesus. It's God's word. It's not for today. It was then, it's now, it's every time. 
and there was blood, they would take six paces and they would offer these sacrifices. Verse 14, as the Ark of the Covenant came back into the center of Israel, then David danced before the Lord, a man after God's heart, with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. David got so excited, he forgot he was wearing his underwear, guys. There's so much religiosity that keeps us from simply talking to God through prayer and hearing from God through his word. Coming to church, going out and sharing the gospel, it's so simple. So David, verse 15, and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet, there was joy. There was, there was God-given joy in Israel. Verse 16, now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, into Jerusalem, <laughs> David's wife, Michael, Saul's daughter looked through a window, notice this, and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord. And the Bible says she despised him in her heart. She wasn't there. You know, you might have friends and family go, you go to that Calvary Chapel Eldoret. I don't even think that's a real church. Do you know in New York, because we have many big Catholic churches. I've got to end, I've got to end. Okay. Many big Catholic churches. And people will come to our church and it's different. It's just like this. And they'll come in and they'll go, this is a new way to do church. I've never seen this new way. I go, this is not a new way. I said, this is the old way. Do you know that you are doing church more like the book of Acts than most churches in Africa? Do you know Paul the apostle would have never sat in a, a throne on the stage? Paul would rather die than somebody offer him a cow. In Lystra, he rent his garment. They stoned him to death, dragged him out of the city. He went to heaven. He said, finally, I'm home. They prayed for him. And he went, ah, no. He came back to earth. They healed him. He says, oh, I was in heaven. Could you please leave me there next time? You know. Listen, it's the presence of God. It's the last point, number four. Following Jesus is worth it all. Following Jesus is worth it all. Listen, listen. Whatever idol might have a hold on you, I promise you, it's costing you more than you realize. Bringing the presence of God into the center of your life, Jesus said it so simply, didn't he? Matthew 6, verse 33, he says, but seek first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what? All these things will be added unto you. You know why? Because Aphrodite, Mammon, Baal, And all of this world is bent prostrate before our Jesus. Jesus wins. He's worth it all. He's worth your life. Keep going. If you're here today and you're a child of God, can I tell you today, would you let your heavenly father pick you up, climb the mountain with you, and you might be crying, oh, Lord, I have to get back to worshiping mammon. No, you need to go to church. You need to go to church. I, I invited all the people that I met, so many people, and I'll, I told, I'm like, come to church. They said, oh, I have to work. I said, tell your boss to, I have to go to lunch and take a long lunch break. Come. Come to church. Bow at Jesus' feet. Seek first the kingdom and all these things. Guys, Jesus will take care of you. It might be scary as he brings you up on this mountain and he jumps off with you by faith and you go with the Lord by faith. You do the word of God, even though in your mind it may be different than what you think. But I promise you this, when you hit that water and you go under and you come up with your heavenly father because you have a relationship with him, just like I do, your tears will be gone. And what you will say, you'll say, daddy, let's do it again. And you'll tell others, amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to close this in prayer. Well, I'm going to pray, and then Pastor Peter will close this. Let's pray together. If you're here and you do not have a relationship with God yet through Jesus Christ, even right now, right this very second, you can receive Jesus as your Savior. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. If you're here right now and you are, you are not yet a child of God, even right now in this very moment, I want you to close your eyes right now. And I want you from your heart to God, I want you to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you were buried. And I believe on the third day you rose from the dead. 
And today, Jesus, I want you to be my God, I want you to be my father, and I want you to be my friend. From this day until forever, my life is yours. And this is for all of us, let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege to be with my brothers and sisters, uh, as we say in New York, my brother from another mother. That is all it is, because we got the same daddy, the same father, the same papa. And Lord, I pray that you would bless this church. I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon each one of your people. I pray that the word of God, Lord, would just be a treasure, <laughs> that they would love you. That, Lord, they wouldn't love God, that they would love the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God who is Jesus Christ. As you said, Jesus, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And Lord, I pray that your blessing would just be poured out in this place. Lord, I pray, oh, we pray right now for all of Africa. We pray that the word of the Lord would run swiftly and that the word of God that the God of the Bible, Lord, would be preached throughout this entire continent. And Lord, that there would be a great awakening, a great awakening, Lord, but it would start with us. So Father, bless us. Lord, may all the Dagons in our life fall as we just bring in your word, as we just bring in your presence, as we just show up to church and gather with the saints. May all the idols fall. And Lord, may we bring your presence out into the streets of, in, of Eldoret, into Nairobi, throughout Kenya, throughout all of Africa. And may all the false gods be toppled throughout Africa. That the glory of God, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit, the river of God's blessing, that at the resurrection was poured out, that it would flow and nothing would hinder it. God, I just thank you. I thank you for the privilege to be here, to be with my friends. Lord, may we just be encouraged and may, Lord, this may, may this be a helper for our joy as we serve you together. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.